Hey, what's up guys? As many of you noticed, I was off of YouTube for several months. No, I didn't go anywhere cool or do anything exciting. No, I didn't get arrested. Um, no great story to tell. I've just been busy because I have the privilege to run a full-time photography business. And I consider it a privilege because I get to do something that I love every day and get paid for it. And the reason why I've been able to survive financially in this tough photography climate is because of my high volume photography business. Um, although my portrait business and my commercial work and my sports brings in a little bit of income, it's not nearly enough to support a family full time. But the high volume photography has stepped in and I make a significant amount of my, money, of my monthly income from high volume photography. Despite the fact that I spend a relatively small portion of my month actually doing high volume photography. So even though I don't spend a lot of time on it, I make the majority of my money from my high volume photography business. So several of you have contacted me over the last couple of months through social media or email and asked if I could talk about some of these, some things relating to high volume photography or asking questions about it because I've mentioned it in a few different videos. And high volume photography is one of those weird things where you can't Google it and get a whole bunch of information. I mean, you can Google how to make an explosive device and you can get a bunch of different returns in Google. But if you search high volume photography, you're gonna get a very limited amount of information. I know that's the way it was when I started, you know, I've got, I, I had a relatively short background in photography whenever I started doing high volume photography. I'd only been doing photography for like a year and a half when I picked up my first organization. And I, I wasn't even trying to become a professional photographer. It just kind of happened. But you know, my experience was, was really minimal whenever I first got started in this. And I didn't really know where to turn to for answers or anything like that at the time. And I tried to Google how to organize a shoot and do all this stuff and I couldn't find any information. And now a few years later, I look up the term and there is a little bit more information, but there is still not a lot of content out there. So I figured I'd put this series together and it's gonna be a series of videos and I'm gonna walk you guys all the way through from start to finish on a high volume shoot of what I do, how I go about making new contacts and all of that stuff. So I'm gonna probably give you more details than anybody wants to know about high volume photography because there are just certain things that I never thought of whenever I got started in this. And let's actually start off by defining what I mean by high volume photography because each genre of photography has its own definition of high volume photography. I've seen portrait studios referred to as high volume because they've got like two or three photographers that are you know photographing a couple hundred kids a year. I've heard of wedding photographers that do like 30 weddings a year considered high volume photography and, and that's a very those are very busy studios but to me high volume photography what it means is you're bringing in hundreds maybe even a thousand people or more and you're photographing them in a very short amount of time. And that's what high volume photography is to me. Typically it's gonna be kids. For me in particular, it's mostly sports pictures, but it could also be you know going in and photographing a junior high school for their yearbook. Um, it, it could be a lot of different things, but to me that's what high volume photography is. And so this video series is gonna be centered around going out and photographing like a little league and how I go about getting the organization to sign up with me and preparing for the shoot things to think about at the shoot, all of that good stuff. This video series is more designed towards, you know, like I said, photographing an actual little league, not just a team. Although you could get some information on pointers and tips and things like that for individual teams. If I do an individual team shoot for like a smaller team of 12 to 15 players, I tend to customize the shoot a little bit more um, as opposed to when we go out and photograph like 400 kids, it's gonna be a very generic shoot because we just wanna get them done. So is, this is gonna be a video series. In this particular video, this is kind of the introduction and I'm gonna talk about probably the most interesting thing you guys are gonna to wanna to know is I'm gonna give you guys some approximations of what I expect to make off of a given shoot. Um, because I've read a lot of bad information or information I think is bad anyways online in forums about the profitability of this kind of uh, photography. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about how I go about getting new contacts and bringing a new organization on board to let me photograph them. And then in part two, I'll talk a little bit about gear and lighting setups to do the individual and the team photos. Um, and part three, I'll talk a little bit about whether you should self print, send it off to a print lab, print options, package options, that kind of stuff. And then part four, I'll probably just try to bring it all together and clean up anything that I missed. So, you know, whenever, when you talk about high volume photography, you know, this is the, the first thing that came to my mind. And this is actually what actually got me to uh, decide to do this. What happened was an organization had approached me because I was taking sports photos, I had started just taking pictures of my own kids. People started paying me money to take pictures of other kids and it kind of grew for me like a little side thing that I was doing, making 
you know, thirty, forty dollars a week, and I was happy because I was just getting to take pictures. And an organization approached me and they asked me to start photographing their their teams. They run year-round recreation sports, and I told them I wasn't interested. I actually, to be honest with you, I thought portrait photography was lame at the time, and I didn't want to do it. And they were really unhappy with the photography company that had been coming out and doing their pictures. They felt the customer service was poor, the shoots took too long, the image quality was bad, all kinds of stuff. And I told them, no, thanks, I'm not interested. So a few months later, they approached me again, and they asked me to take it over again, and I still told them I'm still not interested. So a few more months later goes by, and they come up, and they ask me another time. And I said, look, I just, I'm not interested in doing that kind of stuff. And by that time, I was starting to get into portrait photography and flash photography and that kind of stuff, but I wasn't really experienced and feel real comfortable doing it. And uh, the organizer told me, look, here's the deal. The, we've got 400 soccer players. They've got three weeks left in their season. The other photography company can't come out here for four weeks to even photograph these kids. So if you can't do it, then the kids just aren't going to get pictures this season. You know, we at least think about it. And so I was like, yeah, okay, I'll go think about it. You know, I had total intentions of telling them no. And that night, my son came home and he had brought his picture packet for football, you know, the prepaid envelope. When I got started in this, I had no clue where to even order these things or what they were called or anything. But he brought home his little prepaid uh, order form, you know, the one where you tear it off and then you've got the envelope that you fill out and put your money in, give it to the kid and send it back. And I was looking at it and you know, I was like, man, these guys charge a lot of money for this stuff. So I was kind of doing a little bit of math in my head and I was like, okay, so if there's 400 kids, if I could get an average of $15 a kid, that'd be like $6,000 that I could make and you know, five and a half, six hours of shoot time is what they told me it was going to take. Um, you know, I was like, okay, pay a second photographer, you know, let's say printing cost me 50%, which I knew was an extremely high number, but I just wanted to make sure my bases were covered. I was like, that still is going to leave me like 25, 2600 bucks minimum off of this shoot. And so I was like, all right. So I called them the next day and said, I'll do it. And as far as I'm concerned, that first shoot was a complete disaster. It was actually spread out over two days. We did two and a half hours one day and three hours the next day to get, get all the kids done. And it was just a nightmare. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. You know, my only concern, I pretty much had assumed going into the shoot that they were going to use me one time and then go back to the other guy and realize that how good they did have it. Um, but after the first day of shooting, my concern was that I didn't want to have to refund everybody's money because the picture quality was so bad. Um, the funny thing is, is that the only complaints that they got were from parents who were upset because we were actually on time with our uh with our schedule. We took team pictures when we said we were. Um, they had gotten so used to the company that the that had been coming out to take pictures of the kids being an hour to an hour and a half behind schedule consistently that many parents just wouldn't show up until 45 minutes after their scheduled time for their team picture. And then a lot of parents missed their team pictures as a result and they called and complained. And you know the the organization that uh, had brought me in said, look, if that's the only thing they've got to complain about, then we're pretty happy. And now it's been you know well over two years, and they're still my largest single client. So when I was a kid, you know, and we played t-ball and stuff, if we actually had the money that month, we'd get something like this. This is called a memory mate, you know, and the team photo went here, and then our individual picture went here. It was like a little wallet that went up there. And you can still buy these online. I have no idea why any company would use them anymore because it's 2016, Photoshop's easy to use. You don't even have to use Photoshop because you can do it all with your print service and they have templates, so all you gotta do is drag and drop the pictures in. So, you know, nowadays, this is the new generation of Memory Mate. Basically what you got is the same thing, it's just instead of it being in a little cheap cardboard thing, it's a single eight by 10 print. So you got the kid's picture here, you got the team picture there, you know, the kid's name, a team name, the year, and you know, you can have different designs with like a little, like this one has a basketball logo, that kind of thing. Um, or, you know, that one came from Miller's Lab, uh, which is one of the print labs that I currently use, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a later video. Um, and this one here, I actually designed it myself, which I'm pretty proud of because I suck at designing things. But you know, it's the same thing. You got the individual here, the team there, or, uh, the team photo there, the team name there, the kid's name, all that good stuff. Um, the reason why I designed this, just on a side note, is all of the memory mates that I could find online had this photo in a portrait orientation, up and down, as opposed to the landscape orientation, and I wanted it as a landscape because, well, we're only seeing the very 
upper part of her body in this picture, and that's the way that the whole, the whole team picture was went. They were underwater, most of their body. So it made more sense for me to have a wider shot than a taller shot. But I couldn't find a memory mate that, uh, that fit what I wanted, so I just made my own and had these printed. So the memory mate, this 8x10, when I sent it off to Miller's, it cost me $1.56 to have it printed and shipped to me. We currently sell these for $15 a piece, and this is our by far our number one selling item that we have. So that's not a bad markup. If I can pay $1.56 for something and sell it for $15, that's pretty good. And you know, when you can run a large number of kids through and you can get these kinds of numbers, it's pretty good. Now, not everything is, you know, a multiplier of, of 10 on what we sell. I mean, for example, this is the Memory Mate plaque. It's the same exact thing, except for you've got your 8x10 print on the inside that's enclosed in, you know, a regular plaque. Um, these cost me $12 to have printed, I sell them for 30. Um, I know most other studios in my area sell them for 40 to 40 to $50 a piece. But I'm pretty content with marking something up $18 when it doesn't take me any extra time or effort to order the plaque as opposed to the regular memory mate. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with those markups. But you know, we, we've got it all. I mean, we, we do the 8x10s, the wallets, you know, and, and like I said, not everything do we mark up 10 times. Some of it is significantly lower than, than, than 10 times cost. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna give you guys some actual approximations of what we actually made from a couple of shoots last month. And these numbers hold pretty consistently true regardless of the organization that we photograph. And, and these are approximations because, um, one, I'm not getting along very well with the Internal Revenue Service and the California State Financial Tax Board. So uh, so I don't want to give any real numbers out because they're being mean to me. But um, but no, I, seriously, these what happens is, is whenever I order from Miller's, they have a Part of their program where I can input my retail prices for any given item and then they'll calculate everything out for me and say okay this is how much you made off of the, these items this is how much you made off of that item and, and Miller's assumes that all items were sold at full retail price which isn't the case and I'll get into that later of why that isn't the case but so so these numbers are a little bit inflated not a lot but they are off just a little bit and i'm too lazy to go dig out the real numbers anyways so we'll just run with these approximations okay but it should give you guys a pretty good idea so the first day we went out we photographed a junior high school age girls softball league so i guess the girls were probably about 12 to 14 somewhere in that range so there were about 115 girls in the league. I'm not exactly sure because they had some girls that had dropped off and some that had been added to the league, but there were approximately 115 girls, or I'm sorry, 110 girls in the league. We ended up selling 89 picture packages that day. So 89 separate picture packages were purchased that day, whether it be a buddy picture or an individual picture, we sold 89 separate packages. So that comes out to be about 80% of the kids in the league bought at least one item from us. Now that's that 80% number is on the low end of what I expect from any given shoot. And what I've noticed is the older the kids are, the less, uh, the less the parents are willing to buy pictures. So the percentage of kids that are gonna order is gonna be lower and also how much they spend on any given order is gonna be lower. The younger the kids are, the more money the parents will spend and the more kids are gonna participate and buy a picture package. With the exception of football. When it comes to football, it doesn't really seem to matter what age the kids are, the parents are gonna pay for it for pictures. So like I said, we ended up selling 89 picture packages and we had an average sale of just over $21 per package, which wasn't bad, but it's a little bit lower than what I had hoped for. Um, so our total printing cost that day came out to be $412.31. Now, according to Miller's numbers, I, after I paid for printing, I should have had, I should have had somewhere around $1,500, $1,600 left as profit for a shoot that took about an hour and 45 minutes to do. Uh, you know, now that doesn't count the cost of a second photographer, that doesn't count, you know, the cost of order forms and business insurance and all of that stuff. But you can see that this is pretty profitable. So my, my printing cost came out to be about 22% of my revenue. And that's numbers very consistent. Um, I've only started keeping track of that number the last few months, but I think every single shoot except for one, I've been at 22%, um, and I think the other one was at like 21%. So those numbers, that number is fairly consistent. 
So the next day we went out and we photographed Little League, which was both boys and girls ages three through either five or six. I don't remember what the cutoff age was. For the same, uh, for the same organization, organized both these leagues, but just different age kids. So the T-Ball League had about 175 kids that registered, and we ended up selling 160 separate picture packages, which comes out to be just over 90% of the kids bought at least one item from us. Our average sale price per kid came out to be about $24. So the average purchase was almost $3 higher with T-Ball, and we actually sold about 10% more kids bought the pictures than bought the softball pictures. So the younger they are, the more you can make. So what it came out to be, my printing cost for that, that specific day came out to be $856.24. And according to the numbers by Miller's, I should have brought in about $3,762. And this shoot took a little bit longer. I think we were out there about two hours, two and a half hours, maybe almost three. Because photographing three-year-olds can be a really big challenge because they don't want to stand still, so the shoot just went really slow. But when I first started and I looked around on the forums and things like that, I saw a lot of people saying that high-volume photography is not profitable, the margins are thin, don't get involved in it, and that's just flat out not true. Um, you know, I was reading online the other day, Life Touch, which is probably, I, I'm assuming they're the largest uh, high-volume photographer in the country. I can't think of any company that would really compete with them in terms of the volume they do, but Life Touch is estimated to break in 500 million to $1 billion annually. That's a lot of money. Now, do I think I'll ever get on that level? No, and to be honest with you, I don't wanna ever get on that level because I don't like high volume photography, to be perfectly honest with you. I do it for one reason, and that's the money. Uh, if it, like I said, if it wasn't for the profitability of high volume photography, I wouldn't be able to be a full-time photographer the rest of the month because although my portrait business is going well, I just don't make enough to support my family and my kids are brats and they demand all the best stuff in the world. And so, you know, it's just, I live in an area that doesn't really appreciate art very much. Um, and, you know, they look at a photographer as being somebody who shouldn't charge you more than $50, $60. And a lot of people are just willing to go with somebody on Craigslist who will charge them, you know, 40, 50, $60. And, uh, you know, so it makes it tough to, find enough clients that are willing to pay what I think my time is worth. Um, you know, not that I'm, I'm struggling too bad to find them, but it, it's just this really eases my mind because I know even in the summer months, which here in Bakersfield, it gets well over 100 degrees during the summer, nobody wants to go take portraits. You know, same thing in the wintertime when it's horribly foggy out. Nobody wants to go do portraits, but they'll still have the high volume stuff coming in every month and it allows me to continue to have an income and you know stay profitable. So I already talked a little bit about how I got signed up with my first organization that they approached me, and I was pretty fortunate that um, I think my first two or three organizations actually kind of approached me. I kind of put some feelers out there that I was interested in, and then they came to me and asked me to do their, their photography for their teams. But I, I think that that's the biggest challenge is how do you get organizations to sign up with you? And for me, because I don't like the volume photography end of, of what I do, because I'm somebody that's not motivated a ton by money. Um, I know that sounds weird. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like to have money. I like to have nice things. But whenever it comes to what I do for employment, I have to find enjoyment in what, I, in what I'm doing or else I'm just going to be a miserable person. And I'm willing to sacrifice not making as much money if it means I'm going to be happy at work. And with the volume photography stuff, I... It's just so boring. It's just repetitive. There's no real photography skill involved. You're basically just setting up some generic light setups, and you're trying to run these kids through as fast as you can. There are times that we organizations are scheduling us like 70 to 75 kids an hour to photograph. And so it's just an assembly line of just boom, boom, boom. You know, push the button, onto the next kid. Push the button, onto the next kid. There's no interaction. There's no getting to know your client. It's just, to me, it's very boring. And so... For that reason, I've purposely not been as aggressive as I probably should have been in growing the volume into my business. Um, although I have steadily grown it over the last couple of years, I still only shoot probably about three days a month, maybe four days a month of, of volume photography stuff. And even then, it's only a couple hours per shoot. And, you know, there's obviously some time that goes into reviewing the images and doing that kind of stuff. But, but I just flat out haven't been as aggressive with growing it simply because I don't want to become a full-time high-volume photographer. I, I don't mind doing it a few days a month, but 
up until just recently, it really wasn't a priority for me. But now that I have a son that will be starting college here in a month, um, you know, I'm a little bit more motivated to make money than be happy. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I don't know how well my marketing strategy will work for people, let's say, in a large town. I don't know how well my marketing strategy would work for anybody, to be honest with you, because I'm surprised it worked for me. But, you know, I live in a relatively small town. 20 to 30,000 people live here, and then there's a series of small towns around us that are about the same size. And my growth strategy centers around community involvement. I really think that to be a volume photographer, being active in the community is your best bet. Um, otherwise, I think that the only real shot that you'd have at being successful in volume photography is to become a franchise. And then you've got the franchise name backing to help you get into an organization. But other than that, I think that you have to have be fairly active in your community. But you don't have to be liked because, you know, nobody likes me, but yet I've still been able to bring in a bunch of teams. But everybody knows who I am. I've lived here my entire life. You know, I was senior class president and, you know, all this stuff. And now my oldest son just finished up basically doing all the same stuff his dad did in high school. So, you know, we're kind of entrenched in this community and we've lived here forever. And, and I used to coach youth sports. Well, like just the fact that you're present and you're active, it keeps your name out there and people will remember you or hopefully remember you when it comes time to call, call a photographer. You know, and for me, as I stepped into the volume photography, I had very limited experience. I had no formal education in photography. I was still watching a bunch of YouTube content to learn what I was doing. And I look back at my first couple of shoots and I think that the image quality was just absolutely horrible. I have no idea why anybody would have brought me back after the first time, but they did. Um, it's gotten much better. I, I still question how good I am, but you know, it's gotten much better. At least I'm somewhat competent now. But despite it all, I still kept acquiring new organizations. And there's a couple of things that I did to uh, to be able to effectively market myself and get my name out there and make sure that people remembered it when they needed to call a photographer. Because here's the thing, you can go out and you can take the most epic photograph of, let's say your kid or your spouse or whatever, just an awesome portrait, best one ever. Post it to Instagram, get a couple hundred, maybe a few thousand likes, whatever, everybody, hey, great. But when it comes time for those people to call somebody to do their team pictures or to do a senior portrait session or whatever, they may remember you, they may not. Um, I can't tell you how many people have told me, oh, you know what, we hired somebody to photograph whatever was going on in their life and we completely forgot you do photography. And we call this other person. And the, so you, the key is, is to get people to remember who you are when it comes time to call a photographer. And really, the only the way that I went about it is I just photographed everything. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere in my hometown without seeing me stick a camera somewhere and start popping off some pictures. I mean, that didn't sound right, did it? Um, I was fortunate in that as I got into photography, I had a very flexible job schedule that allowed me to spend a lot of time at my kid's school. You know, I got to go on field trips with them and do things like that. And I would always take my camera to photograph my kids and, you know, my, my friends' kids. And there were always situations where, you know, kids see a camera, they just want you to take a picture of them. And I didn't want to be rude to these other kids, so I would snap a picture. And, you know, sometimes the pictures would be really good of these random kids. And I was like, what am I going to do with all these pictures of these kids? Like, you know, I don't want to seem creepy out there taking pictures of other people's kids that I don't know and... So what I started doing was I started putting the pictures on a disc and I would go down to the office, you know, after a field trip or whatever, and I'd drop a disc of pictures off and say, look, I took these pictures on the field trip. You guys can do whatever you guys want with them. But, you know, I thought I'd give them to you guys. And real quick, I started getting Instagram followers and, you know, just different things like that. And I know that not every photographer is going to have the luxury to go on their kids' field trips and photograph kids and stuff like that. But my point is, if you can photograph other people's kids for any reason, or just other people in general, but kids specifically work well, and do it without looking totally creepy, um, people will remember who you are. I was up in Taft, California last month, which is 45 miles from where I live. And I, I had a big lens with me. I was photographing a youth uh, track meet. I wasn't there formally to photograph it. I was there because one of my sons was competing in the meet. And as I walked up to get something to eat with my lens and my, you know, rather largest looking camera, uh, one, of the, one of the ladies behind the counter asked me who I was there to photograph. And I said, oh, I'm just here to photograph my son's school. I, I told her the school he went to. And she's like, are, are you Vince Martinez? And I was like, uh, yeah, why? And she goes, well, I know that you're from Wasco. 
you know, I know that that school's in, in Wasco. And she goes, I knew that you were from Wasco because you post a lot of pictures of Wasco High School. And uh, so I just kind of put two and two together is what she told me. And I was like, okay, like, you know, I was like, well, but still, like, why, why do you know so much about me? And so she told me, well, you took a picture of my daughter playing softball last season. And it's her favorite photo that she's ever had taken, you know, and just went on and on about this picture. So, you know, I thought it was kind of cool that here I am, you know, 45 minutes away from home, another town, you know, a couple towns over, and this lady knew who I was. Well, then all of the girls behind the counter all started telling me similar stories. And, you know, then they started asking about senior portrait sessions, and I ended up booking three senior portrait sessions as a result of it. But my point is, they've got some very competent photographers that live in their area, but yet they still are going out of, you know, what they normally do and want to hire me to do stuff for them. And they remember me not because of an epic picture I took of anybody else, but because of a picture that I took of their own child. And that's the reason why I always say that whenever it comes to my sports photography, the actual action photography, I don't really make very much money off of it, but I do it because it's great marketing. People remember who you are when you take pictures of their kids. So that's the first step that I take towards getting in with organizations, getting my name out there. I've mentioned this in other videos. Once you get to the point to where an organization wants to talk to you about you know, you doing their photography and you can get some kind of meeting or either formal or informal, um, you need to have two things because a lot of organizations have tried bringing in parents or uncles or, you know, former athletes to do their team pictures. And a lot of these organizations have had disastrous results. I mean, sometimes not as bad as others, but um, I've talked to a couple organizations where either the picture quality that they got back was so unbelievably bad that you know, people were infuriated. Or I talked to one organization where they never even got pictures back when they brought a parent in to, uh, to do the photography. The person just basically took the money and never came back. So a lot of organizations are reluctant to bring in a mom or a dad or an uncle to take pictures. The way that you're able to step around that real quick, in my opinion, and this goes for all aspects of photography that I do, Whenever I show them that I have a business license, or actually I don't even really show them the business license, I fax over a copy or email over a copy of my business insurance, instantly their whole mindset changes to talking to me because now I went from just a guy with a camera to, okay, this person is professional, he's got insurance, obviously he's you know aware of liability, you know, liability issues, and, and it just instantly changes the mood of how the communication starts going once they, they realize that I'm serious about it. And it just doesn't cost that much. It really is a very insignificant amount of money that you spend. And plus, it protects your gear if it gets damaged or stolen. Outside of that, whenever it comes to getting a new organization, um, almost all of my communication is informal. Um, it'll be something like, you know, while I'm at a high school football game, I see the youth football program coordinator sitting in the stands and I'll just walk over and start up a conversation and tell them I'm interested in, you know, taking over his organization. And that's usually how it goes. It's that kind of thing where it's just a very informal conversation with a board member because most of these organizations are nonprofits. So they're going to have a board and that kind of stuff, you know, and I'll just start hitting up board members that I know. And that's where being active in your community and being from a specific community, it kind of benefits you as opposed to if you're in a large city, you're just not going to have any clue of who these people are. But, you know, if you're in a small to mid-sized town, you can pretty much find somebody that either directly or indirectly you know and start making conversation and make headway. Um, there's a website called Templates Unlimited. That, I think it's Templates Unlimited. I'll put the web address right here because I don't remember the exact web address right now, but you know they, they've got a bunch of information on high volume photography on their website. And one of the things they suggest is letter writing. And I've tried this and I've had zero success. I'm not saying it wouldn't be an effective strategy for anybody else. I'm saying for me personally, I've never even gotten a phone call back whenever I've written a letter. Um, so it just is something that just didn't work for me. Maybe it'll work for you, but I don't even do it anymore. I just talk to the people in charge and, you know, hopefully get them on board with me. Now, for, as far as contracts go, uh, I know that there's some people that are going to be up in arms about this, but I have no contracts with any organization. All of the organizations that I work with currently have, um, they're basically, it's like an at-will thing. They call whoever they want at the start of each season and they bring in whatever photographer they want. When you start dealing with your larger organizations and your uh, larger school districts, they are probably going to put it out to bid or have some kind of formal agreement in place. 
but I've been pretty lucky that everybody that I've dealt with, has, we've done it informally, um, which could be a double-edged sword. I mean, it could create problems at some point if I don't deliver something that they expect, but um, so far, so good. Now, the other little dirty secret of high-volume photography is the... I don't know how to phrase this. I guess you could say kickback, bribe, donation. I don't know what you want to call it, but um, I, I can't. I can't tell you how prevalent it is, but it is very well known that a lot of organizations want something for free if they bring you in as the photographer. And I don't have a problem with this as long as you know everything is completely legitimate. For example, the first organization that I started shooting for, the soccer team. You know, when they brought me in, they said, "Look." The, um, the other photographer gives us a 5x7 for every coach and a 5x7 for the district office. And when you walk into their district office, they have all of their current season pictures, you know, 5x7s on the wall. And so they said they give us those for free. Is, is that going to be a problem? And I said, no, you know what? I can eat, you know, 78 cents per 5x7 cost times that by 30 teams a season or whatever the number comes out to be. I was like, okay, I'll just factor that into how much I've got to charge. No big deal. Other organizations want, you know, free plaques for their sponsors. Um, I have one organization currently that wants, um, that wants 10% of the net revenue. And, and they were very upfront when they, and they actually approached me and asked me about switching. And they said, this is the agreement that we currently have with the other studio. Will you give us the same deal? And I was, I said, okay, you know, wasn't too thrilled about it, but they were very blunt. They said, look, we look at this as a fundraiser. And so if you want to charge 10% more, go for it. If you want to charge even 20% more, we're okay with it. As long as we're going to make more, as long as we're going to make more money to provide these kids with what they need, we're happy. And, you know, when they said that, it kind of made sense to me because there are teams that are struggling financially and they need new equipment and things like that. And so if a team wants to do it as a fundraiser, then I'm all for it. I, what I won't do is I will not pay cash to any organizer that brings me in. Um, like I said, these are mostly nonprofits. So if you paid somebody cash and they got to keep that money, uh, that would probably, that, that would constitute a bribe and that would be illegal and I just don't want to take part in that kind of stuff and I can't tell you how prevalent it is I don't know like I said I'm from a small town so you hear rumors whether or not the rumors are true I, I don't know all I can speak about is was what I do and like I said every organization that I work with expects something uh, for free and you know I've had I've had organizations that said hey all we want you to do is can you come out for you know one hour this entire sports season and take some game pictures for us that was all they wanted. And can we have some of them to put on our website or our Facebook, their Facebook page? Yeah, no problem, you know. And, and that, that's another thing that I try to do. All of the organizations that I work with, I try to make sure that they have images for their web pages, their Facebook pages, and I don't, I don't charge them. I mean, if I can go in and, uh, you know, for example, the team that, that wanted the 10% cash, I ended up writing them a check for, I think it was like 480 something dollars. Um, no, it was 580 something dollars. So uh, that was 10% of what I made after I paid for everything. And it took me basically all day, a Saturday, eight hours on a Saturday to do this entire organization. And, you know, if I can make that kind of money in a single day, I can give up a couple of hours of my time to go out and take some pictures of their kids participating in the sport. And I can even give them some images. I don't haggle with them over, you know, hey, I want $10 per picture or whatever. I just sent them some images for them to put on their website, and they credit me. They link to my website on their websites, and uh, which I never asked for. You know, I find that if you treat people well, they'll treat you well, and you won't have to worry about it too much, for the most part. Not all the time, but for the most part. So that's about it for the introduction into volume photography. Um, I know it was a bit long-winded, but there's just a lot of information that I want to give you guys because I don't want to see anybody get blindsided like I did as I went through this process. And I also don't have a perfect system for this kind of stuff. So if anybody sees any flaws or any ways that I can improve on this stuff, I would love to hear about it because I've just learned by trial and error and I'm still making a lot of errors. But hopefully I can cut down some of the mistakes that you guys make. I'm hoping to have this whole video series out within a, within a week or so. I apologize, I'm losing my voice. I actually had a volume shoot today or makeup shoot for a swim team. So I've been out in the sun all day. Um, I probably look disheveled any as well, but um, if you guys do have questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them in one of the later videos because this will probably be a four-part series. So 
Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great day.